Hello, my name is Georgi Angelov, and we are going to talk about dictionaries and link. Dictionaries, or as may other people ref refer to them as maps or associative arrays, are widely used through the realm of computer science. You'll always face dictionaries or maps whenever you're working with certain projects. We're also going to talk about Link, which is just an extension library built into C Sharp that is, that is going to help us tremendously. Now, the first thing that we're going to discuss is a dictionary. And the dictionary, as it's called in C Sharp, is just a way or an implementation of an associative array. We're going to see how it works and why it, it is so efficient and so widely used. In other words, we're going to look at mappings of keys and values and how are they used throughout computer science. The next thing we're going to look at is link, lambdas, and data processing. Data processing is as important as everything else in computer science. We we are first going we're going to look at dictionaries first and after we know how to store information inside these dictionaries we're going to look at some ways of processing that information that we got and to help us processing this information we need link we're also going to briefly discuss lambdas and it might sound confusing but lambdas are just inline methods. Finally, we're going to look at some ways to filter, order, and map information using the built-in library link. Let us now dive deeper into the topic of dictionaries and link. Hope you have fun. The first thing that we need to talk about is associative arrays. Now, it doesn't really matter if you call them associative arrays, dictionaries, maps, or even symbol ta tables. It's all the same thing. You might hear people who come from Java to call them maps, or you might hear people coming from JavaScript call them associative arrays, or jo even JavaScript objects. It is one and the same thing. An associative array or maps are a huge problem in computer science. Fortunately, this problem has been already solved. And the problem is the following. How do we keep key value pairs or keys associated with values? And are we able or how can we query such key value pairs in a fast manner, add and remove from them. And a classical example of such mapping is the phone book. Let's look at this certain phone book. Now, this here is a pretty good example of a phone book. We have a name and an associated phone number. And as you can see, we have a, a narrow which represents the association. If we have Peter here, we have 1255 or it's 2350 452 167. This is the number of Peter. And if we want to have a phone book in our program, if we want to represent a phone book or any kind of key value pair, we need a map or associative array or a symbol table as it's commonly referred to. Fortunately, as I said, this problem has already been solved and we have a ready implementation inside C Sharp. And this implementation is called dictionary or even sorted dictionary. We have a class called sorted dictionary which we're also going to briefly discuss. Now, we're not going to talk about how this problem has been solved. This is internalizing the problem. We're not internalizing the problem. 
We're only going on the surface. We're exploring on the surface. In this video, we're going to learn how to use these dictionaries instead of how to create them. If you're curious about that, you can Google it. Now, discussing the internals will only confuse you at this point. On the other hand, if we talk only about the surface and how to use the already solved, uh, the already there solution, you are going to receive this new tool in your tool set that is going to tremendously help you when you solve problems. Let's look at another common problem with associ associations. Let's talk about a huge conference. Imagine there is a huge conference and you have around 4,000 people there. Now you have this list on which you have written the names of the people. But if you want to find someone there, you simply have to check every single seat for that person. On the other hand, if you have a tuple or key value, key and a value, and this value is the seat, you can find this person really, really fast. So if you have only the name there, which is the key, you are not going to be able to find him. You have to look everywhere. But if you have the seat associated with this person, you'll just know where he is. Now let us look at traditional arrays and associative arrays and compare them. First of all, as you can see here, a normal traditional or traditional array, we have indexing. Now, you, you probably First of all, we got the traditional array. In a traditional array, we have this sequential data structure that has some values indexed by some numbers. And this is the sole limit. We have numbers, which we call indexes or indices, and we have a value associated with them. The thing is that we are pretty limited to the amount of problems that we can solve using, and I mean solve efficiently using this data structure or the traditional array. On the other hand, an associative array is just an array indexed by keys. And these keys can be anything only if they are unique. So everything can be a key and this is limited only to unique items. So you cannot really put collections here which can change through time. You need something that is going to be definite and it's always going to be unique. In other words, if I try to add John Smith again here, this is not going to happen. I cannot add a redundant item here, a redundant key. Simply dictionary won't allow you. If you try that in C Sharp, the dictionary collection will just fire an error and you won't be able to add a duplicate key. Associative arrays store pairs of keys and values compared to traditional arrays where you have only an integer as a key and some value as value okay, or some number even some string it doesn't really matter. And as you can see here, keys in associative arrays can be every, anything, as long as it's unique. You can add strings as keys, you can add integers as keys, you can even add more complex objects. There are some rules to that, but we're not going to dive in depth. For now, using primitive types, such as strings, num numbers, floating or integers, it doesn't really matter. And these keys have an associated value. Let's see that in practice. Okay, now we can simply create an integer array here. We have integer array 
we create a new integer array with the size of 5. Okay, let's populate it. So let's say integer array, let's give to index 4 the value 15. Let's give to index 1 the, via the value 6. Let's give the index 0 the value 12. Okay? Now, let's see what happens if we create a dictionary here. So we create a dictionary, we use a string. You can see here that creating a dictionary in C Sharp, you need to specify the type of the key and the type of the value. And you always need these less and greater signs. Without them, it's not going to work. Okay? So you, you say dictionary of some type and some type. The first type always represents the type of the key and the second type always represents the type of the value. So we have a string and a string again. We're going to create something like a phone book. We have a phone book, new dictionary of string. This is how you initialize a new dictionary of some type. And as you can see the difference here is that Defining an array of integers, we can only define the type of the value. So it's not an association. It's always going to be indexed, and it's always going to have a defined value type. Compared to the dictionary where we, all, we can always specify the key. We can always specify what type it is. And we can always specify what the type of the value is. And look at the difference now. So in this dictionary or associative array, as an index, we're using some string because we said that the values or the types of our keys are going to be strings. So now instead of indexing using integers, we can index using strings. And this is one of the greatest bonuses when, we, when it comes to associative arrays. Now we can say John Doe has a phone number of 00123437887. So this is the, the number of John Doe. And you'll see here that if I say phone book of John Doe again, and I say something like this, simply what will happen is that it's going to override the old value and it's going to give us 1255 and it's going to be associated with John Doe. The same thing will happen if we go here and we access the same index and we give it a new value. Okay, so as you can see, associative arrays and normal arrays are not that different. The key difference is that associative arrays are key value pairs. They're actual key value pairs. Whereas integers arrays or any type of normal array is only a value. S arrays simply don't understand what an index is. They don't store indexes, indices. They don't store them. Whenever you access some index or some item on some index, it's calculating the position of the item dynamically. It doesn't store the index. It's just a sequential data structure. It's something like that. We have one, we have five, we have seven, we have nine, and we don't really store any indices. Whereas in an associative array, you have key and a value you have key and a value, okay? So it's pretty much the same thing. We just have more flexibility. We can use strings as keys, we can use integers, we can use floating numbers, it doesn't really matter. Now, if we add another one, and by the way, it is case sensitive here, so the, the keys are, are case sensitive. You can say John Doe with small letters and we'll have the both entries. 
if we now inspect this data structure, we say, well, let, let's use an easier way. We can do this, set, set a breaking point, debug, and we can see now that we have both values there. It's not overridden. Okay, we just press F11, and we look at the phone book. It didn't happen. Let's let's just print it out. Let's say string that join a phone book with a comma. Okay, so we get this, and we can print it out. Now we should be able to see the contents of this dictionary. We have John Doe 1255 and John Doe with capital letters is 01234378887. Compared to the normal array which we can print here, you can see the difference. We have the same separator, but now we have the integer array. Can you see the difference now? We got no key here. It's only values. Arrays don't really understand what indexes are or indices. They don't really understand them. So it's not a key value pair. On the other hand, associative arrays are keys and values. And we can mimic an array with them. It doesn't really matter. So we can say integer and integer. And we can say, uh, now you'll see, you'll see here that it gives us an error. Why? Because we specified the data type of the key as integer. But we are trying to place a string as a key. And this simply won't work. The compiler won't allow, it, allow us. And we need to fix this one here too. And by the way, uh, an, easier, an easier way to specify such dictionary is to say var a phone book equals new dictionary of int and int. Okay, so this is an easier way which doesn't require you to write that much and you can see here it's still a dictionary of int and int. In order to use these dictionaries you need to specify system.collections.generic. It is mandatory. Without specifying here this line, if we delete it, you'll see that dictionaries won't work. It, it simply doesn't know what the dictionary is. Fortunately, we can say using system.collections.generic. Okay? And we have the dictionary. Now, if we change the, uh, the key here to 5 and the key here to 0, you'll see that it's still not, not okay. Why is it still no, not okay? Because we have strings as values. And we specified that the key value pair is going to be made out of integer and an integer. If we change it here, say 5, and if we say 6, this is going to be fine. Phone, let's just rename it to phone book. Okay, so this is completely fine. And if we start a program, this is okay. Now, the thing is, that the values, doesn't, it doesn't really matter if they're unique or not, because they're just values. On the other hand, the keys need to be unique. So let's use the add method instead. If we say add 5, 5, and you'll see here that we are adding the same entry. And by the way, it doesn't really matter if this is 5, because as we said, values that doesn't really need to be unique. You can see that it's completely okay to do 7 here and to do 5 again. This is completely okay. But it's not okay to add another key of the same type. Okay, so adding another key 5 is not going to work. If we say start without debugging, you'll see an item with the same key has already been added. And this is what we call an argument exception. Or you can see it here. 
generic dictionary, blah, 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 blah. Add is not working. So add is not working. If we remove this line here, remove this line, everything works perfectly. So we have, instead of a generic array or a traditional array with only values, we have an array with asso keys associated with values. We have 557506. Five, and as I said, this extends or this opens up a way to solve even more, even more problems, even more efficiently. Now, this at method is part of the dictionary itself. So if, if you can say dot, phone book dot, and you'll see that we have add, aggregate, blah, blah, blah. We have compare, we have count, and different properties and, and methods, which we're going to discuss briefly in a moment. Okay, so the main difference between associative arrays and traditional arrays is that associative arrays can have key values, key and value pairs inside them, and we can use any data type as a key and as a value, as long as the keys are unique. So if we have, uh, let's say, a problem, uh, if we have a problem with a phone book, we can use associative arrays to solve the problem efficiently. Why? Because we can search in a fast manner using some key. But if we have a phone book problem that is solved using a traditional array where you don't really have key value pairs, you only have values, you don't really know where this exact pair of things is. So you don't really know where the exact place of the person you're looking for and the seat you're looking for is stored. Even if we store something like a tuple, let, let's say we have the situation where we have an array again, and this array, instead of stor storing plain values, let's say pr plain integers, it stores tuples. So we have Peter, five, Jordan, six, or something like that, etc. If we have something like this, it is still not possible to solve the problem efficiently. Whether it's the conference problem or the phone book problem. Why? Because let's say we are presented with the name Jordan and we ask the array, where is Jordan? Can we ask the array that? No. Why? Because the array only understands values. It doesn't understand keys, it doesn't understand anything else. It only understands values. And to access these values, you need indices. So where is Jordan? Well, we can't know. Why? Because we need to go through every single value, look at the key in the tuple, and then look at the, the actual value of the, of the place. Compared to that, if we have an associative array where we have Instead of indices, we have the key itself to reference the value. We have Jordan, if we have Jeffrey, if it's written this way. It, if we have an associative array where we have something like this, if we ask the associative array, where is Jordan seated, or what is the, the number of Jordan, what is the phone number, it will know. Why? Because it is using the key as an index instead of plain numbers. Okay? So instead of having plain number indices, we now have some unique key to use as a reference to the value. Whenever we are looking for a value, we are going to look using the key. But if we have a plain array, it doesn't really matter what the key is. Plain arrays only understand indices. We are accessing values only using indices. They don't really have keys. Now, one of the main properties of dictionaries, and by the way, you'll see something here called sorted dictionary, and this we'll discuss briefly at a later time. We have a property called count. And this property count is the number of key value pairs stored inside this dictionary. We also have property called keys. 
and this property called keys will return a unique set of keys that is stored inside associative array. We'll see that in a moment. We also have another property which is really important called values. And this property values is a collection of all the values inside this associative array or this dictionary. Let's see that in practice. Now, let's dispose of this array because we don't really need it. We're not going to work with arrays anymore, at least for now. And let's use something like a string integer. We'll say this is Jordan, this is George, and this is Peter. Now before that, let me show you something. As I said, you can access you can access the values using the keys. And we can say here, give me the value of George. And this is completely fine. It's going to give me the value of the the value associated with George. And by the way, you can see here that I misspelled George and it said key not found exception. This is the same as index out of bounds exception when you have arrays. If you have arrays, if you say give me the item associated with index minus one, it's going to say index out of bounds. And here in associative arrays, since we have different things as keys, as tools to associate you with, we get key not found exception. To mitigate that, you always need to specify the correct key here. So we say George, say start without debugging, and we get five. So we solved the phone book problem. And if we have an actual phone book here, let's say we have string and string, we have zero, zero 05 something like this, we have one two three or one five thirteen, we have seven eight, something like that we can get a pretty good result here so we say give me the phone or the number of Jordan and it will gladly hand us its his phone number and if we had a normal array this wouldn't happen why because it, it only understands when saying things like 0, 1, 3, 4, 5. But here you can place strings as keys. You can say Peter, and we get the correct answer. It's 87789. Now, as I said, we have a property called count. We can say phone book that count. Now, what do you think that the count will be here? Pause the video, try to figure out yourself. The answer here is three. Why? Because we have three entries, okay? We have three entries and the count gives us the number of entries. What else we can do? Well, we can say print the keys that are inside this phone book, separated by a comma. And we'll see here that we get Jordan, George, Peter. These are the keys that are inside this data structure, this dictionary. At the same time, we can say, give me only the values. And we can get the values. The values 0513515115138789. 5, 1, 5, 5, 1, These are the values. And if we, if we were to add another one, let's just print the keys too. We get phonebook.keys. And by the way, phonebook.values and phonebook.keys are collections. These, these are not individual items. Even if, we, if you have only one key value pair, you get collections. You can see here that this is a key collection. This is not a normal variable, this is a key collection. And the same here, this is a value collection. You can see it right here. It says value collection, this is of type value collection. So don't try to use these in calculations. You need to traverse them in some way. Now, doing this will give us the values and the keys inside. So we get Jordan, which is part of the keys, and we get the value. 
if we add another entry, key value entry inside our phone book, we say George and the number zero one two three five six something like that we start a program again we get the same thing and now we have the new value that was added and the new key that was added okay you also have the basic operations which are add remove clear and there therefore you can use them so if we go here and we say before printing the contents of this phone book we say clear we won't get anything as a result you see we don't really get anything why because clear clears out this associate associative array and if we say something like phone book dot add and we add a new key uh, by the way we saw previously that adding the same key won't override Okay, so don't try overriding some key using the add. Override only using this notation with the square brackets. So if we try to override here, if we say phone book of Jordan equals one, two, three, four. Let's command this for now. You'll see here that it will override because we already have Jordan, it will overwrite its value. But what happens now is if we say dot add and we say Jordan here, add Jordan with some value, you'll see that it's not going to work. It said an item with the same key has already been added. And if we add Jordan, all small caps, we are getting the new value pair, key value pair, okay? So avoid using add where, where you're not, when you're not certain that the key doesn't already exist. And we can actually try, or we can check if the key already exists before we add, but that we'll see in a, in a moment. The other thing that we have is called remove. So we can use this remove let's say we we add Jordan here but we know that this is going to throw an error and we want to add we want to remove this Jordan entry before we add it again so what we do is we say remove Jordan okay so we remove the name Jordan and by the way you cannot really remove in a fast manner using the value so it's you're not really supposed to remove entries from the dictionary using their, their values. You're only supposed to work with the keys. Uh, you can find a way around it, but it's not really advisable because the solution will get pretty messy and it will get pretty slow. So if we, remo if we remove the Jordan name before we add it again, you'll see here that the value is just updated. And you'll see that the value is one to five. Why? Because we removed the name Jordan before we added it again. So we, we remove the key value pair before we added it again. Let's go back now and see another set of methods that we can use when working with dictionaries. And by the way, you don't really need to know that these methods by heart, but you need to know that they're there. So you can solve more problems using them. And the first thing that comes here is called contain ski. This is extremely important when working with dictionaries. Why? Because you can check whether there is an entry, a specific entry, inside this dictionary. You can say console write line, phone book, contains key, Jordan. And you'll see here that I wrote Jordan using small letters. What do you think happens now? Okay, what happens now is we get false. Why? Because we don't have a key value pair with a key of Jordan using small caps. We have such key, but here the J is all caps, or it's, it's a large capital letter. Okay, if we say Jordan with J capital, we get true. 
this is how you use contains key. Now, what one thing you can do with contains key, if we remove the remove method, you can say if phone book contains key of Jordan, simply don't do anything. Or if it doesn't contain the key of Jordan, just add it. Okay? And you'll see here that now we have three times where we specified the name Jordan, but we don't really know which value is going to persist. Which value do you think is going to persist? Well, let's see. The value that is going to persist is this one. Why? Because we checked whether the Jordan name is actually inside the dictionary. And if it's not, add it. If it is there, just continue. Don't do anything. This line is skipped, basically. Because contains key of Jordan returns false. And we said, if this is not false, go here. Okay? Or if it contains key. Yep. It should be like this, I think. You can see here that an item with the same key has already been added. But if we if we say different, it will say true. Okay? And if we print phone book of Jordan, we get this value. One, two, three, four. Why? Because this thing here didn't happen at all. Okay, because this is true. Contains key comes out as true, and we said if contains key Jordan is it comes out to be false, execute this. Now the next thing that we have is pretty much the same. It's called contains value. It's pretty much the same thing. You're just looking for value. So you can say if it contains value one two three four one two three four don't do anything here and we can see it here again it, it didn't enter the if loop uh, the, the if statement why because we already have one two three four as a value inside okay so we already have one two three four it's pretty much the same thing you're just checking for values the next thing, which is kind of neat, is called try get value. And what try get value does is it allow. The next thing that we have, which is pretty neat, is called try get value. And try get value is a way to acquire value with some safety. So we have a safety margin. Let's see how it works. Now, let's clear these things a bit and say something like on right line, get me phone book of Martha. So it's Martha. Now, as you, as you see here, Martha is not present anywhere in our dictionary. What happens now is we get an error. The given key was not present in the dictionary. How can we go around this problem? Where first of, first of all, we can use the try get value. So what happens now is we, we can say phone book dot try get value, and you'll see that we can place the string here, Martha, and we can say if you find a key, Martha, with the corresponding value, fetch me the value or give it to me. Let's say Martha value it's just a string and we say give it to me inside this new string I created and by the way you need to place a keyword called out here why it doesn't really matter what matters is what this method does okay so you you need to place the key here which are not, you're not sure if you're not sure that this key is present you can use either try get value or contains key and try get value allows you to directly acquire the value corresponding to the key if it's there okay so try get value of Martha 
if it's okay, if Martha is present, give it to me, give it the value corresponding to Martha, to the key Martha, inside this string, which I created. And without passing a variable in which you'll receive the value, it's not going to work. You see here it says, get the, as, so there is no argument given that corresponds to the required formal parameters. So it requires an out of string here, okay? But if the value here was integer, this wouldn't be out string, it would be out integer, okay? It's the same thing. So we say, if Martha is present, give me the value of Martha inside this variable I created. And I say, Martha value. Now, one thing you can do is check whether try get value gave you m the value of Martha or n it gave you nothing. And you can say bool result try get value returns a boolean variable, boolean result, which tells you whether the, the action was completed or it wasn't. So you can say write is Martha there? or is Martha inside the dictionary? And we can give the result as an output. And we can say, come on, we can say Martha value. And if we start the program, what do you think will happen now? What is going to be the result of this try get value? And what is going to be the value inside this string variable? Think about it for a second. Now, the result is that Martha is not inside this dictionary. And as you can see here, we get an empty string. Okay, so we get some default value of the string variable. If we used integers, Martha value, if Martha value was an integer and this dictionary had integer values, Martha value would be zero. Okay, so the zero is the default value of any integer. Now, what happens is if we add Martha, uh, nine, seven, eight, we can get its real value with try get value. You'll see here that we get, is Martha inside the dictionary? True. And the actual Martha value. Try get value is pretty convenient where you're tr when you're trying to solve some problems where you can have duplicate keys. Now, I encourage you research more about the dictionary, trying to find other methods that are going to be nifty or which are going to be convenient to you when solving problems. Let us now take a peek inside the dictionaries. Please bear with me, we're not going to look deep, it's just a slight peek into the inner workings. Let us see how we add inside a dictionary. Now, first of all, let's add a single key value pair. And this single key value pair is Peter and his phone number. As you saw, we have this hash function through which the key goes, but the value doesn't. What is a hash function? A hash function is a function or a method that takes some input and produces some output. It doesn't really matter right now what kind of output it produces. It's usually a number when we're talking about dictionaries because it needs to be fast, otherwise you can output different things. Now, a hash function is just a black box that takes the key, only the key, and finds its place, or in other words, outputs its place inside an array, or some table. Let's say it's, it's some table. We have some table, and this table represents our dictionary. And we have a dictionary of string and string. So this table expects keys that are strings and values that are strings. 
what happened is we got this key value pair we took the, the key we input it or we put it through some hash function which we don't really care what it is right now it's just a black box that in takes an input which is a key and gives us the place this key belongs to in the table so our hash function found that the first place is the correct place for Peter we can do the same thing again we can add another key value pair and this time it's George and his phone number so George is meant to be here on the second place it could also be right here it doesn't really matter so the hash function determines where in the table we're going to store the key value pair and as you can see here I'll say it once again we put the key through this hash function to find its place and when we find its place like in this example here we take the value and put it here associated with its key and imagine we need to find some value corresponding to some key we do the same thing we go through the same procedure we put the key through the hash function we find its place and we take the value it's as straightforward as this now we can do it again we can add Simon and a phone number corresponding to Simon it is straightforward okay now how do we remove out of this table we already know that we can put things through this hash function in order to add them into the table by the way one thing that we didn't mention is what happens if we add if we say add Peter and 50 okay so what happens after we add a double duplicate the thing is that this hash function is deterministic what does deterministic mean well deterministic means that whenever input it with something it's always going to output the same thing so Peter is always going to give us as an output the same thing if we on the other hand say Peter with small letters it's going to output different different thing but deterministic means for the same input we're always going to get the same output so there is no way and by the way this is in theory mostly there is no way we can get the same output of the hash function by inputting the same input which is Peter and if we say add Peter with 50 Peter goes through the hash function and we'll see that Peter is already inside this table by being inside this table it will just throw an error because it will already know that Peter exists and it cannot add a duplicate key why well imagine now we have another key Peter and another number here what happens what happens if we try to look for Peter what happens then the thing is we cannot really find Peter in an easy way because Peter is two times inside a table so we have a duplicate having a duplicate key is not going to be fun for problem solving why because let's say you're looking for Peter for the value corresponding to Peter well the table won't know or the dictionary won't know which Peter value you want it, it simply won't know which value to give you whether this one or this one and for that purpose we keep the keys unique just so we can find things later so we can find values so we can find entries the thing is that if you if we are using let's say this is a phone book if we we are using this notation here what will happen is we'll get let's say this is equal to 50 we'll get this key we'll input it through the hash function or we'll input this key through the hash function 
instead of throwing an error, it is just going to override this value. It will say 50. And this is the, the, the bonus when using this not notation. But be careful, if you're solving a problem in which you don't need to override, or overriding means not solving the problem, this might not prove worth it to use. You might want to use things such as contains key or try get value. Okay, so let's see how, it, how we, re we remove. The first thing, we get the key. You can see here, we get the key through the hash function. We find its place, it re we remove the entry. So we, 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 we remove the whole entry here. Okay, and as you can see here, everything goes back to its place. In reality, things don't really move that often inside the dictionary. They might move, but not that often. Why? Well, because it's inefficient. Moving every time we remove from the dictionary, it's kind of inefficient. So such a movement might not happen that often, but might happen as well. Okay, so if we want to remove George, the entry with the key George, we can do that. We just put George to the hash function and re we remove the entry. Keep in mind that we cannot really remove by value in a fast manner. Why? Because we don't really input the value through the hash function. The value is always referred through the key. So if, you, if we want to remove the entry with value 0881123978, we will have to go through the whole table in order to find it and remove it. We can do that though. I, Dictionary supports such a removal. Okay, now, how do we loop through collections like this? How do we loop through dictionary like this? One of the things we saw earlier that we can use dot keys property and dot values property. Now we're going to look at a way to compoundly traverse the structure. And by compound, I mean to, to traverse the entries instead of individual key values. We don't traverse only keys, we don't traverse only values. Now we're going to learn how to traverse using pairs. How does this happen? For starters, we have a for each loop. If you're not familiar with for each loop, well, it's, it's like a for loop where you don't really have indexes or indices and you cannot modify while traversing. It's not really possible. Why? Well, the, the, the difference is not that obvious and it's out of scope. First of all, we get the first entry, okay? So if we say key value pair for, for each key value pair of string and string, and keep in mind the value pair, key, the key value pair always has to be the same as the one we specified. For each key value pair, key value pair in the dictionary, take the entry, okay? So we have the dot key, and we have the dot value. And this might not be that clear to you, but after that, we can check it in reality. So here is a nifty example we have, and it's called phone book. In this phone book, we have John Smith as an entry, his phone number, Lizzie Smith, her phone number, Sam Doe, his phone number, and Giovanni, his phone number, and Peter, and his phone number. So we have one, two, three, four, five entries inside this dictionary. We remove one and we traverse it. What happens now? Well, first of all, you can see here that we say for each key value pair inside the phone book, I want you to print out the key and the value. So what happens now is if we start a program, we'll see that we have each key and its associated value. And the way we achieve that is by using the key value pair. But if we, if we say something like for each key collection or for each string key in phonebook.keys, 
we will see that this will only print the key and here it is it only prints the key up until now we only knew how to print only values or only keys in reality if we need just a second okay, so values okay in reality if we need to solve a problem or aggregate a data aggregate data we don't want to use keys and values we want to use key value pairs why because it will give us the key and its corresponding value so we can do something with them okay now as you can see here using values only returns the relevant values inside a collection inside a dictionary but using the method that we learned just now which is for each key value pair inside the phone book we now have the ability to get each corresponding key value pair you can see now in this scope in this scope here we have both the value or, or both the key and its corresponding value and we can do anything we can say right line name and say zero key or phone number we can say one and we can give pair dot key pair dot value okay so we have this context which allows us to access each key and its corresponding value not only the key not only the value but both and if we say start we will say name Lisa Smith phone number one five 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 one two three four and so forth and the reason we don't get John Smith is because we, we, we removed it okay as straightforward as this so keep in mind if you're solving a problem where you need to aggregate a data both the keys and the values you need to use this loop the for each loop using the key value pair type so for each pair of type key value pair string string in the phone book do something this means loop over every entry inside the phone book every entry not only the key not only value but the entry the pair we also call entry one thing you can do to mitigate writing key value pair each time you can say something like for each var pair inside the phone book so right line pair and by the way this this will not work because this is a key value pair it's not as uh, it's not a primitive variable so we can say pair dot key plus pair dot value okay so we can say pair dot key plus pair dot value and a arrow between them and we get it so it's Lisa Smith number Sam Doe number Giovanni blah 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 number number okay so instead of writing this whole thing we might just write var and if you if you press here if you hover over the var it will say this this pair variable is of type key value pair of string and string is the same thing okay and this is the example that we just had so it's the phone book it's the phone book with the entries removing one and looping over the entries okay now I encourage you find some problems some real-world problems and expect or inspect the way they were solved using dictionaries this is going to prove to you that dictionaries or maps or symbol tables are widely used throughout computer science even find problems that you think can be solved using dictionaries and try to solve them on your own with the knowledge base that we already have after we talked so much about associative arrays it is only fair that we solve some problems using them. the first problem that we have is called odd number of occurrences or odd occurrences 
In this problem, we need to create a program that extracts from a given sequence of words all words or all elements that are present in odd number of times, which is case insensitive. What does this mean? Case insensitive means that it doesn't really matter whether the word is, high, is uppercase or lowercase. In this example, you see that we have Java with J capital, C sharp, both capital, PHP, PHP, both capital, Java capital, all caps, C capital, and Java. Now, the thing is that we have as an output Java C sharp C. We need to print the result of elements in lowercase in their order of appearance. Why did we print Java, C Sharp, and C? The reason is, first of all, Java is the first word that we encounter. So it's the first in order of appearance. The thing is that Java is present three times because we know that this is case insensitive. So we count each occurrence of Java, regardless of its casing, as one and the same thing. So we have one, two, three number of occurrence, numbers of occurrences. So Java occurs three times. Three is an odd number. This means that we need to print Java. So the Java, Java word is going to be the first in our output sequence. And it's going to be lowercase because we know that the elements need to be printed in lowercase. The next one is C sharp. We face C sharp only one time. 1 is an odd number, so C sharp needs to be present in our end output. PHP, on the other hand, is present two times in the sequence. So it doesn't matter, it, does, it doesn't get printed. We have C at the end, and C is printed because C is encountered only one time. And 1 is an odd number of times. Okay, so one thing that we need to talk about here is how do we count each occurrence of each word? We can use a dictionary. Now, using this tip, try to solve this problem on your own. It will be beneficial for you to exercise this way. Pause the video and try to solve it. Now, we're going to try to solve this one together okay let's go to the ID and conveniently enough I have placed our input here so we can use it without scrolling over okay first of all we need some way to collect the data out from the console we can do this we can say input is equal to console read line dot to lower the reason we place to lowercase is that we know we need to be case insensitive. So instead of checking whether a word is capital or lowercase, we just say to lower. So if we have this sequence here now, and we can say this sequence to lower, we'll see that it actually gives us the sequence in lower case. So we have Java, C sharp, PHP, PHP again, Java again, C and Java. And now it's way easier to compare different Java words. Why? Because they're all the same. They're all the same casing, so we can do it in pretty pretty easily. Okay, now after we get the input from the console, we need to get the individual words. How do we get the individual words? Well, we can split the sequence by a white space. Okay? So we can split the sequence by a white space. And we can do this. We can say array of strings, so these are the words, equal input split by a white space. Okay? So now, and by the way, this is a, a really convenient trick to solve problems by splitting them in halves. 
okay not only in halves but in parts so this is our input take the input so this is our the part where we take the input take and process the input let's say prepare take and prepare the input now let's see what happened after the processing stage we print our words with a what with a white space so we say words we dispose of the white space here and we print it out okay now we have every individual word inside an array and every individual word is case it's lower case okay let's remove this one how do we count each occurrence the easiest way is to use dictionary but how how can we use dictionary pause and think about it a way in which you, we can use a dictionary is to have a dictionary of string which is the word and its number of appearances okay so we have a, a dictionary of string and int using the word the unique word as a key and its occurrence number of occurrences as a, as a value okay we can say occurrences equals a new dictionary of string and int now what we can do is we can loop we can say for each word in words add the word okay add the word and uh, let's say zero what is the problem here well if we start a program we'll see that it, it says an item with the same key has already been added it means that we have duplicate words and we already know from the problem description that such duplicate words are going to exist how can we mitigate this error one of the ways is we can say occurrences of a word is equal to zero or one let's say one every time we face a word or we find a word it's it's, it's occurrence automatically gets automatically gets to one let's check this out okay and this is okay we don't this is fine we don't really get any errors what happens now if I say string join of this dictionary okay let's join them on a new line so occurrences we start our program and we get Java 1 C sharp 1 PHP 1 and C1 is this okay and the answer is no why is this no okay it's not okay because every time we get a word or a duplicate word we don't add to the already existing count we all always overwrite the, the count and this is a huge problem because if we print by the way this is uh, feed the dictionary with information stage and this is a print the result stage okay so if we say for each pair in the dictionary if the pair if the the pair dot value because the value is the number of occurrences okay so if the number of occurrences is odd print out the pair the whole pair so we say print out or just the key we print out just the key so pair dot key okay uh, we can do this let's say debug and what we get is Java C sharp PHP C this is not the correct answer why because PHP is present two times but because we override it we get it as an output because one is an odd number and because we overwrite we don't get two we still get one and it still get out it gets out of it how can we mitigate that 
the first thing that comes to mind is we need to increment whenever we find another occurrence of a particular word. How can we know if a simple word has already been added to the dictionary? Pause the video and think about it. We can use what we learned previously. We can use the contains key method. We can say if occurrences already contains such key or such word, add one to the existing value of occurrences. Okay? Now, another way to make our code look a little bit prettier is to say if a, if this word hasn't already been added to the dictionary, just add it. Okay, we can say add it with the value of zero. And now we can increment every time we enter the loop. Why? Because every time we enter the loop, we face some word, right? We, we see that some word is either in the dictionary or not. If it's not in the dictionary, we just add it and increment from zero to one. If it, if it was already there and the count was one, we simply don't enter this if, this if condition. So this is not true. So we, we don't add the word if it's already there, okay? So what happens now is if we start a program, let, let us just copy, let's copy this. If we start now, we get only Java, C Sharp, and C. And in C Sharp, the dictionary class, whenever we add something, it, it adds them or it keeps them in the way they were coming. So in order of appearance. If we add Java first and C Sharp second, they will be kept in this sequence. So in order of appearance. The thing is that the dictionary doesn't always guarantee you such positioning. That's why you should be careful. When you hear that you need the result in order of appearance, feel free to use dictionary, but always be wary that something might happen. Okay, and now we need to print the sequence on the same line. So instead of doing this, what we can do is say list of string these are the keys new list just add the spare key to the output list so pair that key finally just output the list okay so we say string a join with a white space delimiter the keys or let's call them output keys Okay, so we need, so it should be working. We get Java, we get C sharp, and we get C. Okay, let's examine the other inputs. Let's copy this, go here, and we, we get five and high. Should we get five and high? Well, five has odd number of occurrences, Three has even number of occurrences. This is why we don't print it out. High has three number of occurrences, which is odd number. We print it. P has two occurrences. Ho has two occurrences. And that's it. We have five and high. Okay. Now one more thing. We need to try this. We get A, 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 which is three A's. 4 a's, 5, 6, 7. 7 is an odd number. We output A. SQL is inputted only once, or we find, found it only once in the sequence, so it's an odd number. We out, output it, and we have XX, which is 
contained three times within the sequence and we output it. Finally, the standalone C here, we output it too because it's only because it occurred only once in the sequence. Okay, so how did we solve this problem? First of all, we took the input. Okay, first of all, we took the input and we made it all lower capital uh, or all lower letters. Why? Well, because we need case insensitive words. We don't really care about the casing, whether it's uppercase or lowercase. This is why we made them all lowercase. And one more thing, we made it all lowercase just because the output needs to be all lowercase. If the output was all uppercase, we could just say to upper. The next thing that we did is that we considered using a dictionary as a key value pair storage to store the, the, the word and its corresponding occurrence count. So we were storing essentially the word and its occurrence count. Okay, so every time we face a new word, we add a count of one. Every time a word already exists, we just increment this counter. So it's a plus plus, okay? And as we know, we need to check whether a word is already contained if it's already contained, just increment. If it's not, create a new one. Okay? And finally, we have the result. And if the occurrence corresponding to the certain key is odd, we add it to this result list and we output the, the result list. So this is pretty much the same as the one we did. So our solution is pretty much the same. And we went through the same considerations as in this solution. Now, it would be good if you go ahead and practice some more. Dictionaries are not that hard to grasp, but the more problems you solve, the better you'll become at them. Before we wrap up the dictionary topic, we need to discuss something that we didn't mention. The sorted dictionary. So what is a sorted dictionary? It is the same, it's the same structure, the same collection as a normal dictionary slash map, but now instead of order of appearance, we preserve the key value pairs in sorted order. So if we have this type of dictionary, of sorted dictionary, the order in which the pairs are going to be is going to be alphabetical. So before we dive into the sorted dictionary realm, let's comment this for now, we'll see that having a normal dictionary, which is a string and string in your dictionary and having a sorted dictionary and by the way sorted dictionary is once again inside the system collection generic let's create a new sorted dictionary the difference is that if we add let's say Peter one two three we add Simon one two three again and we add George, which is one, two, three again. The same thing if done for the sorted dictionary, the order in which the items appear is going to be different. So we have a sorted dictionary here. Let's copy this. Say sorted dictionary. Let's see the order of appearance. So we first of all, we join the first dictionary with a new line, say dictionary. We print out a blank line and we say string join with new line, the sorted dictionary. Okay, so let's make it a little bit bigger. 
and see what happens now. As you can see, the first dictionary pres preserves the order of appearance. But the second dictionary, which is the sorted one, says George is going to be first, Peter is going to be next, and then Simon. Why? Well, the reason is that we sort this dictionary alphabetically, or it's automatically sorted by key. So the, the default sorting or the default ordering of key value pairs inside sorted dictionary is ordering by key. Okay? So this is how sorted dictionaries work. And this is the, the core difference between a sorted dictionary and a normal dictionary inside C sharp and whatever you, you want to. So even in Java, even in Python, the main difference between a sorted dictionary and a normal dictionary is that the sorted one is sorted by key or even sometimes by value, which is not convenient at all. Okay, now let's see what happens here. And by the way, the hash function is omitted, but it's still here. So, so the hash function might still be here. First of all, we get Peter. So Peter is here. We have 0, 8, 8, 1, 1, 2, 3, 9, 8, 7. And then we get Alice. Imagine now Peter is higher than Alice in order. In alphabetical order, P is after A. So what happens now is P is going to get shifted to the second place so we can fit in Alice. And after the operation is done, everything is ordered in alphabetically, or everything is ordered alphabetically. Okay, so let's see another example here. And we have a sorted dictionary of events in their description. So you can see here, if we remove this, I have it already copied. So we have a sorted dictionary of events and the event has the key has has its date as the key and its description as the value now we have various events we have this one which is 1998 and it says Google's birthday we have 2013 which is South Uni's birthday we have 1975 which is Microsoft's birthday and we have 2004 which is Facebook's birthday okay now if we print them out they should come out as ordered alphabetically or in this case ordered by date so we can see here we have Microsoft birth date which is the first one we have Google's birth date which is the second one we have Facebook's birth date which is the third one and the final one is a soft unis birthday As you can see here, we have all overridden this thing. So we have overridden Soft Uni's birthday with this string. But it's still there and it's still at the last place. Why? Because the sorted dictionary sorts the items inside or the entries inside by their key. And the default key sorting by date is just from in ascending order. So we have the lowest date first and going to the highest date. Okay, now let us actually solve a problem that is going to help us in later, when later working with sorted dictionaries. This problem is called count real numbers. We need to read a list of real numbers and print them in ascending order along with their number of occurrences. Okay, so as you can see here, we have this order in which we are given the numbers, the sequence. We have 8, 2.5, 2.5, 8, 2.5. We need to print them in ascending order. What does this mean? Well, it means from the lowest number to the highest one. And their number of occurrences. We have 2.5, which is the one here. And 2.5 is the lowest number in the sequence. This is why we print 2.5 first. After that, we have 8. 
and we have their corresponding number of occurrences. The same thing goes for the second and the third example. And if you examine them closely, you'll see that they always start from the lowest number and go to the highest number. Okay, so how can we solve such a problem? I encourage you, pause this video, think about it, try to solve it on your own, and whether you can or cannot, follow with me through the solution of this problem. Okay, now what we need to do first is to grab or to capture the actual input from the console. And as we know, we can divide the segment and call it input segment. Okay, so we can say string input is equal to the console read line. So this is the sequence of numbers that we're given. Now, we need to actually split these numbers. So string numbers equals input dot split with white spaces. Okay, so basically now what happens is we're going to fetch the numbers from the console or get them from the console using this line and then we're going to split the line using white spaces. So we're just getting the individual numbers inside a single array. What we can do now is create a sorted dictionary. Think about it. What is our key and what what is our key going to be and what, what is our value going to be? Our key, for key, we can use the actual numbers that we're given. Why? Well, because the sorted dictionary is going to order them conveniently enough for us. So we can say sorted dictionary of double here. And why double? Well, because the numbers we are going to get are real numbers. So they are not integers, they are real numbers. And now we can say double as a key, so from the lowest double to the highest one. And we can say integer because we need to save the corresponding number of occurrences with each number. So we're essentially saving a key value pair of a double number, which is the number that we get and the number of occurrences that this number has inside the sequence. We can call this a, our dictionary. We can say new sorted dictionary. This one, Let, let's just compact this into, into var. It's a little bit easier to read this way. Okay, so what we do now is we need to loop each number. For each number, or let's just say for each string number, inside numbers do something okay so what do we do inside this for for each loop first of all we need to grab this number as an actual double number why well if we don't do that we're not going to be able or the dictionary the sorted dictionary is not going to be able to sort them in the correct way it's going to sort them alphabetically which is going to be wrong in our case. We need them to be sorted by value, by actual double value. Okay, so what we can do now is say double num is equal to double dot parse, parse the number. Okay, and we can say if, as we did previously, you can actually check our solutions in the previous examples, in the previous problems that we solved, that we first need to check whether this number is contained inside the dictionary. Why? Well, because if it's not contained, we need to create it. Okay? So after checking whether it, it, it is inside, let's say it does not contain definition, contains key, okay? So if the dictionary contains the key, create it, or null it, make it null, make it zero. This is not going to work, thus we need to place the exclamation mark, that means if the key 
is not contained inside the dictionary, just add it. This is the logic here. And we add it with a current number of zero. Therefore, we need to increment. So we can say dict of number plus equals one. What happens now is if we face a number that's already inside, we're just going to skip this part. So this part is just going to be skipped. We're going to go directly to this part where we increment the occurrence count. Finally, after we process the information, we say uh, process the in or process the data. Finally, we can say right line to the console. Let's see in what way they okay. So right line for each key value pair of double and int. So for each entry in the dictionary, we say dict. We say console right line. This is our key, and this is our value. And so we say pair that key, pair that value. Keep in mind we don't really need to sort them, because the sorted dictionary already did this for us. Now we need to input something. So we need eight, two point five, two point five, eight, two point five. This is the way we test our program. So we have. 8, 2.5, 2.5, 8, 2.5. You get input string was not in correct format. Okay, well, th this is an actually Windows issue, so we need 8. Instead of comma, or instead of full stop, we need a comma. So it's 2.5, 2.5, 8, 2.5. And we have 2.5, and this is just a Windows issue, which has three numbers or three occurrences and we have eight which has two occurrences and we need a, an additional string here which is called times okay so we need times we can check again we, we can use this example where we have negative numbers so this example gets minus 2 0 0.33 0 0.33 2 and we need to output minus 2 first one times 0 0.33 two times and 2 which is one times Okay, let's see whether this output, whether the output of our program is correct. So we get 2 or minus 2, 0 0.33 and 2. And here we need a comma. Okay, and 2. So we get, oh, we need 2 times 0 0.33. Okay, let's go here, say minus 2, 0 0.33, 0 0.33 and 2. And we get minus 2, which is 1 time, 0 0.33, which is 2 times, and 2, which is 1 times. Okay? So our program is working. Our solution is working. What did we do? First of all, we took the input from the console. We created a sorted dictionary out of double and int. Why? Because we know that we are going to get numbers, real numbers. And we know that we need to keep their occurrence count inside the dictionary. So created, we created a pair of double and an integer. Because the number we get from the console is real number and we cannot store it in int because it's float it has a floating point and we know that we need to store its occurrence count. We looped through each input, through each number that we get in the sequence, we parsed it, and we added it to the dictionary. As we already know, we needed to check whether this item or this number was already in the structure or already in the dictionary. And if it's not, just add it, okay? or just add it here. So, so we just create it if it's not in the dictionary. But if it's in the dictionary, we just increment its value. Okay, so basically, if we have Peter or let's say 2.5 and we need to add it inside a dictionary and we have this table here, which is 
key and value if we don't really have the number we just add it we say 2.5 1 if we find another 2.5 we just remove this one here make it 2 if we find 3 we add 3 with 1 if we find another 2.5 we remove the 2 and add 3 or just increment the 2 this is what happened inside our sorted dictionary and every time we added a new entry it just sorted things out it ordered them in a convenient for us way finally we output the input the already fetched information or already already processed information now as you can see the solution here is pretty straightforward and it's also almost the same as the one we did so we correctly solved this problem now if you want to get better at using dictionaries whether sorted or a normal one I advise you to solve more and more problems as much as you can get even try to find problems where so where nested dictionaries will be required or in other words find problems that you'll need a key and a whole new dictionary as a value so let's say we have a football team for each town let's say this is a key and this is a key again so we have Sofia here as a town and we have a team here okay so we have some team here and some some town this is the town and for each town let's say this is London for each town we have a whole new dictionary in which we keep the actual team and let's say some points so let's say 31 31 it doesn't really matter so for each town we have whole another dictionary as a value and this makes them nested even more complex to use and work with okay so find problems that will challenge you and that will increase your capacity for problems It is time that we talk about LINK. So what is LINK? LINK stands for Language Integrated Query. And it is a way to abstract data processing and aggregation and to do it regardless of the source of information. So imagine we have data coming from three things. It's a data coming from a database data coming from the user and data coming from some cloud link provides you with the capability of processing this data regardless of where it comes from so you can create a method that processes a collection and after that it doesn't really matter where this collection comes from so you can wire this method to work with the cloud you can wire it to work with the local database or wire it to work with the console input or the SDN so basically this is what link is and you'll see in a moment that in C sharp we have this library or namespace called system.link and inside this namespace we have all of these utility functions that perform different queries and aggregate data in some way in order for our source to be aggregated with using link it needs to conform to some rules about these rules and about the inner workings of link we're not going to talk about it's simply out of scope the key moment here is that we need to learn how to use link without knowing what ha what's happening inside why well because it's a super powerful tool that will help you 
solve a lot more problems, thus improving your mental capacity. Okay, the first thing that we are going to look at is the math operations that come with link. The first one is the min function. What happens is the min function finds the smallest element in a collection. And keep in mind here that when working with link, we're talking about collections. Simply because link works on collections, it just queries them. Some, some information regardless of its source. So min function or min operation re returns the smallest element in a collection. So if we have this collection here, regardless whether it's a list or an array, we get minus five when we call the min function on that collection. And let's see it in reality. So we go here in our main function and we create a simple new collection. So it's int, let's do this. Let's say int list, new list, and let's add a couple of integers. So we add five, we add six, we add two or one, doesn't matter. So let's create an array. Let's create an integer array, called array, and let's populate it with some data. So it's a five, six, two. Okay, now what we can do is say list dot min. And whenever you add system dot link, this is the, 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 the actual library that we're going to work with, or this is part of the core library, Whenever you add the system.link, it will automatically attach this method. These are called extensions, which are kind of out of scope here. But what happens with the extension methods is that they get attached to certain classes or to certain objects. It doesn't matter how right now. The thing is, whenever you specify, when you say using system.link, you get an attachment to your class or to your object. And using this attachment, it's, it's, an, it's a function attachment, functional attachment, calling it will return some value based on the items that reside in the object or based, based on the object itself. So when we say list.min, this should print the smallest integer inside the list. Okay, since the contents of the list and the array are the same, we, we need to expect that array.min and list.min are going to output the same thing. But why does min get attached to both of them? Well, as I told you, it doesn't really matter what kind of collection it is or where, where, where it came from. When you're using link, they all work, almost all work with link. So, so methods get attached to them. Even if it was a dictionary, you could still do something like min. Okay, let's start this program and we see that the smallest item in the list is 2. And the smallest item in the array is also 2. So this is what min does. Basically, min goes through all the elements inside a collection and finds the smallest one. What happens inside is probably it, it just loops over them for item in array find minimum and finally it says return minimum or something like that this is what happens inside min most probably you, you can actually check it out it, it's not really it's not really that complex okay so it's decompi decompiling if you have a decompiler you can check what's happening inside a min so it's looking for a minimum number so it's for, for the number with the lowest value okay Th that doesn't really matter so if you, if you want to explore link yourself just add a compiler decompiler to your visuals to you or whatever id you're using and go through the code yourself okay the next thing we have is the same as min but the opposite 
So it's a mathematical operation, but instead of getting the minimum element, the, the smallest element, it, it gets the, the largest one or the maximum one. So if we change min to max, and by the way, link always attaches methods. This is how link works. It attaches met methods, it extends the objects with additional functionality. This is the simplest explanation of link you can get. It just extends the capabilities of the collections. And as we can see here, now we should get six instead of two. So if we start a program, we get six and six. This is what max does. Okay, the next thing we get is sum. Now, sum most probably won't work with strings. So if we create a new list here, and sum is pretty straightforward, it's just the summation of all elements inside a collection. We say strings equal new list of strings, and we say strings that add one, strings that add two, strings dot add three. Having this saying strings dot sum shouldn't do what we expect here. Say list dot string does not contain a definition for sum and the best extension method overload is queryable, blah, 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 blah. It doesn't really matter. But as you can see, the, the summation here is undefined. So be careful when using these methods. Sum is usually used for numbers. Basically, you can use it for doubles, for floating numbers. You can use it for long numbers and integers. Even shorts, U shorts, it doesn't really matter what kind of numbers. It's basically numbers. So if we say dot sum here, and that sum here, we should get the sum of the elements. But if we change one of them, we'll see that the changes doesn't really matter. It's always getting the result. So we have 98. This is the result of the summation of the elements of the list. And we have 13, which is the summation of the elements in the array. Okay, so sum is pretty straightforward. Next, we have average. The average is just the average of all elements. So if we say dot average here and dot average here, you'll see uh, average, the, the, what average does is it says list dot average or list dot sum divided by list dot count. So this is what arithmetic average is, right? So we get console right line and we say average list sum divided by count. And this is the list list direct average. Okay? So basically what happens is Inside, it's just using the sum function and the count to calculate the average. But conveniently enough, we have the direct method to use. So we have dot average. Instead of doing it ourselves, dot average just averages over every single element. And we can see here, list sum count is 32. And we have 32 point six 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 seven well the thing here is that we divide it integers right we divide it integers and this cannot really produce float so we need if we want to get float we need to specify that one of them is going to be float now if we do this well it breaks yeah uh, I mean it needs to be a double because floating point precision is not that precise at all so if we go here, we'll see that these are the same numbers, okay? So average, the dot average method just takes the arithmetic average of a collection. It's the sum of the elements divided by the count. Okay, now having these in mind, we can solve a problem. And this problem is pretty easy one. We have 
the sum, the min, the max, and the average of numbers or of a collection. So we get collection. We need to read n integers and print their sum, their min, their max, and average values. So the first row, we get an integer. And this integer is the actual number of integers in our collection. And the next n lines, we get the individual integers in the collection. Finally, we need to output their sum, their minimum element, their maximum element, and their average. It's a pretty straightforward problem. I encourage you to pause the video and do it yourself. Try to be as productive as possible. Okay, now whether you haven't or whether you have or you haven't you haven't solved this, the problem, we'll go through it together. So first of all, we need to get to capture the first line, which is the integer count. We say int parse zol read line, and we get the first line. So now, on the next n lines, on the next integer count lines, we need to capture each number inside a collection. Let's do that. Let's say new array of size integer count. Let me close this thing here. Of size integer count and we capture them inside this array. So every, every new line, we parse the integer that is given to us. Say console read line, okay. Now, finally, we have link, and using link, we can say something like sum. We can say something like min, max, and average. Okay, so we can say min, max, and average, okay? We can get integers dot average. We can get integer dot max, integer dot max. We can get integers dot min. You can, you can see how nifty these extensions are uh, these ad additional functionalities coming fr from the language integrated module of C sharp we can say sum and finally we can give some input so we have 5 12 20 5 12 20 we have minus 5 37 minus 5 37 and 8 so we get 72 minus 5, 37, 14.4. And it's the same thing. So it's 72 minus 5, 37, 14.4. And I'm pretty sure that this will be valid too. So our output for such input would be valid too. Okay, so what did we do? First of all, we used link. So we specified the statement if it's already specified, you don't have to do it. But if it's not, just say using system.link. And I can show you here. Let, let me just close this one. Okay. So we have system.link using system.link. The, the same way we did using system.collections.generic. After that, we get the number of integers that we're, we're expecting from the console. We create a new array. We loop over this n just to grab every single integer that is given to us on the next n lines. We grab that integer, feed it into an array. And after feeding it into an array, we're using link to process this information or to aggregate it. Conveniently enough for us, okay? So it's a pretty straightforward solution and it's pretty much the same as the one we did. Okay, now the next set of functions that we're going to look at and try out 
are the mapping and ordering functions. What do mapping and ordering functions mean? For starters, mapping functions are functions that transform from one element, they transform one element into another. And when combined with a collection, it's like this black box through which all the items in the collection go through and they come out transformed at the other end. So basically they are just transformed and put back into the collection. Ordering functions or methods are ways to sort collections or to order them in certain way. Let's see this, these in practice. Now the first one that we are going to look at is the select. And a, so the select is a mapping function. So what select does is it takes a number or any kind of item that is inside a collection and it transforms it into another item. So it's like saying, it's like doing a for loop and changing each item in the for loop. Let, let me show it, show it this way. Okay, so in our previous exercise, we had this problem where we had a collection of items which is coming from the console. Let's do it this way. So we have sequence of integers which we needed to capture in some way. What we did is we first split the collection and we did a for loop. This for loop helped us parse each number inside the collection and turn it from string into integer. What we can do with link is we can morph these collections or the items of these collections into something else. Or we can map, in other words. So mapping means that we have this collection of items. Three, four, five, blah, blah, blah. And mapping takes each of these items. Let's say the mapping is x plus 5. This is a function. And this is actually a lambda function, where, which we're going to discuss in later videos. So we get this morphing from one collection to another. So it takes every single element, feeds it through this function, and I'm talking about a select here, and they come out as different elements. So the function here is x equals or y equals x plus 5 or x equals x, for x plus 5. So now x stands for the item in the collection and what we need to do is to add 5 to each item. So we add 5, we got 6, 7, 8, 9, we get 10, we get 11, so forth, so forth. Okay, so it's just a way to morph a collection into another one or just change every single element in this collection with some defined criteria. Now, what we can do here is instead of taking the, the line that, that is inputted to us, so instead of doing this, instead of doing console read line, and then taking every single or splitting the input, split input equals input that split. Instead of doing this and then looping over this splitted input, doing something like reach split reach input in reach in in split input, parsing every single input saying in dot parse input or something like this instead of going through all the hassle here we know that what we need to do is go through every single item in this collection that we capture and just transform it into integer 
what we can do using the link we can say read line that split directly this just helps us split the collection so if we have five six seven it just removes the white spaces and we are left with a collection consisting of the numbers we can say dot select and we can say hix or x is now int parse x so now every item every single item is now its integer equivalent so we are basically transforming each element in the collection into something else this is what select does so we are inlining this transformation we're saying for every item for every item in the collection get me or substitute it uh, substitute is the better word substitute it with its integer equivalent and what happens now is let's actually do this for now just say var var here okay so var works pretty well so we can say for each or let, let's just do this say console read line or write line string that join and this okay uh, integer count or transform input let's call it transform input okay so if we do this we get some error which we need to fix and the error is where oh here it is yep we don't need this one we don't need this one either so we start a program and we get five seven eight 11 minus 2 or minus 5 and as you can see now we parsed the inputs captured them as a line split the line and by splitting the line we got a string array of numbers using the link or using the select method that we have we said take each number each string number or each string in the collection that we have and turn it into an integer okay what we could do here is we could say take the string and say string dot pad left five okay so doing this for every element it would it would pad it left with the character C until it reaches length of five so we are not limited to any particular morphing here we can do pretty much everything that we want and you can see here that we have CCCC5 CCCC1 CCC minus five so forth so forth okay so select is just a way to map each item in the collection that we are selecting from into other type okay and since after this split method since after the split method we get collection of strings you will see that the actual variable x here refers to a string variable okay so whenever you want to see what kind of variable you get after some action you just hover over the x and you get a string or another data type here now one other thing you can do is instead of writing this syntax which we're going to discuss a little bit later you can write directly through which function you want to input the items okay so instead of doing this we could just say int that parse what happens now is the select method is going to feed each element in the collection into the int parse method 
So it's something like that. Imagine a black box. And this black box is the select method. And we have some output. Okay? So we have some input. Input is the collection. And we have some output. So each item is transformed here. So this select method is a black box that transforms the each item in the collection in some way. And we get the modified collection here. Collection. Okay, now fortunately we can control what happens inside the select method by passing it something like a lambda function which we did. We're going to discuss lambdas a little bit later or just passing a method. What we did here is we said int.parse, just int parse. So we put the int parse inside a box. What happened is every collection item, so every item in the collection went through int parse and went to the output. Okay, so it's just transforming each and every entry inside a collection using this method that we par passed here. If we remove this, nothing will happen. We get a, an error, okay? So if select doesn't know how to handle or what to do with the elements, it just won't allow you to do anything. Now, the next thing that we need to see is converting collections, okay? So converting collections means we get one collection and we need to convert it into other collection. So what we can do here the next thing that we need to see is converting collections. So converting collections we get one collection and we turn it into another one. Okay? So Basically, what happens after the split here is we get a string collection. So we get a string array. Con Console.readline dot split by white space means that we get a string collection or a string array. What we can do now is transform this array into an actual integer array. Why? Because the sequence that we get is going to be numbers. But how do we do that? Well, we do that using the link functionality. First of all, we select each integer or each string in the string array. We turn it into an integer. And finally, we say to array. Why? Well, because select doesn't really return an array itself. It returns something completely different. And by the way, we need to change this one here. As you can see, first of all, split returns a string array. And from string array, we use the select to transform the, transform the elements in some way. And we use to array to specify that we need to transform the string collection into integer collection or from string array into integer array. What we can also do is instead of going from string array into integer array, we can say list of integers. And as you'll see here, this will not work. It will say that cannot implicitly convert type integer or array integer to list of integers. What we can do now is say to list and we get the transformed collection. Okay? And now we can actually write on the console the fifth item or let's say the first item. If we input a collection, let's say this one, you'll see that we converted this string sequence into an integer list and we access the second item. This is going to tremendously affect the way you solve your problems. 
Why? Because now you have this nifty way to convert from collection to collection and to morph item to item. So from the beginning, we had a collection of strings and this collection of strings, we turned into collection of integers using the select method, which transforms every single entry in a collection into another type of entry. And we morphed the result from the select function or converted the, the result from the select function into a list of integers. This is how link basically works. And it's really useful for this for purposes like this. Now, what we can do here is show you that we can do different things. We can say we have a integer collection, which is, let's see, let, let's do it this way. Okay, so we have this integer collection, new int, let's give it some items, five, six, eight, one, 10, 11. Okay, now imagine we want to, okay, now one thing we can do is work with strings simply because working with strings is going to be a little bit better. John Doe, okay, so we get a couple of names just for, just to make it a little bit more convenient. Uh, let's make um, John Mo. John Fo, Liza, and Liza Gardner, something like this. It doesn't really matter. Now, what we can do is say transformed output dot select, and as we know, select takes an item and morphs it into other item. We can say for every item in the collection, split it, split the item by white space. What happens now is we split every single name into first name and possibly last name. So we can split and take the first name. Okay? Now we can say dot to array. And initially, let's call it just array. Initially, we had this with both the names together separated by white space and now we have only the first name and we, we need to print it so we print the array and we get this oh we need we need to join the collection together so joining the collection together with some delimiter will give us the correct result so we debug and we get John 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 Lisa. Why? Because we morphed every single element into this. So we said for every single element in the string array, split it by white space and take the first string. So the first string when split by white space is the first name. So we mapped every single name into only the first name. This is one possible way to use such link functions and we also used the two array to turn the, the new collection that we created using select back into normal array but we could also do things like list of strings and we could say dot to list okay so it's pretty much the same thing and this is working as well so it's john john lisa lisa or John, 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 Alyssa. Now, what we can also do is use the two dictionary method or the two char array. Now, the two char array simply takes a string, let's say string uh, name, let's say John Doe, and invoking two char array. Uh, name dot two char array we can access each individual character so we are turning this name into a character array or character array 
and you can see this now. So it's basically the same thing, but now we have the characters. And a better way of looking at them is saying string dot join with this. Okay? So we have the string, but just split it into characters. We have J O H N white space D O E. And the di two dictionary, the two dictionary method, morphs a normal collection into dictionary. And the way it does it is you choose which item to be a key and which item to be a value. Okay? Now, another really, really important thing inside a link or a capability that link has is ordering. And you'll will you'll be required to you to use ordering when solving problems. First of all, we have this list of numbers. Saying numbers that order by the number itself or the item itself, it will order in ascending manner the numbers. So we'll get the numbers but ordered in ascending. Okay, let's see it this way. So Let's create a list of numbers. A list. Let's say numbers that add five, numbers that add seven, numbers that add ten, numbers that add minus five. And we can have a list of strings that says numbers or string numbers calls new list. And we can say string numbers dot add, but this time we add the numbers as strings. Just so I can show you how it works. It's seven. It's strings that add. Let, let's just copy them because it's going to be a lot easier. We can say ten and minus 5. Okay, now saying string dot join and strings let's do okay, let's do this. We can say numbers dot order by x. What this will do it will it will go through each element in the numbers list and it will order them. And the way it's going to order them is first ascending or it's first going to look at the way integers are sorted by default and then it's going to sort them by ascending. The problem here is that using this method on the same contents but in string format is going to order them in different way. Why? Because strings are ordered in a different way than integers. And order by is going to use the default sorting way of the data type. So if we copy this, place it here again, and change the name from numbers to string numbers here, which should, we should be pretty good, and we can see the difference. So this is the numbers, numbers list, and this is the strings, string numbers okay so we can see that the string numbers were not ordered by ascending they were ordered probably alphabetically and the numbers list here that that contains integers the numbers list was ordered co correctly in ascending order from the lowest value minus 5 to the highest order by is pretty straightforward and as I said, orders, it orders different elements in ascending, depending on their data type. Okay, now after order, we have the same thing, but now ordering occurs or happens by descending. So first of all, we had ascending order in which, from, from the lower, uh, in which it, it orders from the lowest to the highest value. 
But now if we call order by descending, we would get the reversed sequence of numbers. So we get 10, 7, 5 minus 5. As you can see, 10 is the largest number, 7 is after that, 5 is after that, minus 5 is after that. And if we compare it with the order by method, let's compare it with order by, order by, we'll see the clear difference between them. So this is the order by descending, this is the order by, Let, let's label them. So we have console right line, order by descending, and we have the order by without the descending one. So we have order by without the descending. Okay, and let's output. We see that order by descending, it does what it's named for. It's or, it orders the items by descending order. And order by does the opposite. It, it, it orders them ascending. So it's minus five, five, seven, 10. And this is the reverse, 10, seven, five, minus five. You can pretty much order by descending or ascending almost anything, anything that can be ordered. Okay, another really cool usage of the ordering functionality in link is the then by. So what happens now is we have a dictionary. You can see the example here. We have a dictionary of products. So we have dictionary of products. What happens here is we take each product, we order it by ascending first, by each pair value, then by each pair key, if the pair values are equal, and then convert it to dictionary. Let's try it out ourselves. Okay, so we have dictionary of what it was, string? Was it was a string? Yeah, integer string. Okay, so we have integer and string. So we have dictionary or products, let's call them products, new dictionary, and we can say dictionary of int and string of ordered products is equal to products dot order by let's call products dot order by x dot value but let's call it pair now when ordering or when querying the dictionary you're actually querying key value pairs so here you can see that we have a key value pair of integer and string so we can say order by ascending using the value of the pair and then order by descending or just say then by then by pair that pair that key and finally we need to say to dictionary because then by You'll see that then by doesn't really return a dictionary. It returns some obscure collection. We can say pair where pair.key is a key and pair where pair.value remains a value. Okay, now bear with me. This is what happens here. First of all, we have some products. And let's actually populate these products. Let's say something like product one let's do it this way so let's say product one or five let's say one product one okay let's say two product two let's say three product three okay now what happens is we are going, or let, let's do this one, P, A, C. After ordering by value, it is going to put the, this string, the second one, on the first place. So it's going to move this entry here on the first place. And it's going to move the third entry to the second place. 
and it's going to get the first entry and move it to the last place. Why? Well, the reason is that we are ordering by value. We are moving around entries based on value. And after that, if we have two values which are the same, let's say we have four, which is, or let's say minus one, which is product three, what happens now is whenever it faces two equal, equal values, it is going to sort them by key in ascending matter. So if, it, if you are wondering what will happen here, it will move the lesser key upwards. Why? Because the values of the entries are equal. And if they are equal, we go here in the then by function. So then by says whenever we have a normal ordering like order by, and we, whenever you have two equal items going through the order by instance, we are going to compare by something else. Okay, so if if we are comparing two people using the order by and then by, and if we say if uh, or order the people by eye color, then by hair color, if we have two people that have the same eye color, the program is going to order them by hair color. This is what then by does. It's just a secondary way of ordering. Whenever you find two items that are the same in order, we use then by to distinguish or to choose which one is going to be on the left and which one is on the right or, or which one is going to be the previous, which one is going to be the next. They're basically their sequence. And finally, we are saying that we want to convert this new collection that we have, this new ordered collection, this one here, we want to convert it into a dictionary. For that purpose, we said that we want our keys to remain keys and our values to remain values. But we, what we could also do is we, we could say key plus, or this is key, say this, okay? So what happens now, oh, okay, so we need a, an integer. We can add five to each key. This is completely fine. And you'll see here, after printing it out, that we get each key with additional five. Okay, because we're transforming this collection that we got here, but at the same time, we are adding five to each key. And doing this, you'll see the difference between the two collections before the link and after the link. So we say join using new line, the products, and after that, join using a new line, but now we got the ordered products. Okay, starting program will yield this result. So first of all, you can see here that this is the unordered collection. And after we have ordered it, you will see that to each key, we have five added. So we have this, 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 and this. First, as you see, they are ordered by the value in ascending manner. After that, they are ordered by key descending or ascending. So this value and this value are the same, but this key is less than this key. This is then by in action. Okay, and finally, after the then by, we added five to each key in the collection. Okay, now, if you didn't understand this example, feel free to go over it a couple of times because two, two dictionary, the two dictionary function, the two dictionary extension from the link is actually pretty complex itself. And the order by and then by is probably confusing for you too. So solving some problems might even help for that purpose.
Now, another really nifty way to use link is using the take and the skip functions. What we can do with take and skip is we can take particular number of items or skip particular number of items from a collection. So if we have this dictionary here, and I, I'll be using dictionary because you'll see that regardless of the source of information, they always work. So we, we say something like, okay, from this product's collection, or let's print it out, from this product's collection, give me only the first two one. So I can say take two one. And this here, the take, will return only the first two entries of the, uh, of the dictionary. And you can see here, we get only two of them. Now, wh what I can do now is say take two, or let's say take three, but skip one, okay? So now I can say skip one. What will happen now is we'll take the first three, but we'll skip the first and essentially will print out only the first two or only the, the, the second and the third. The first two is going to be, uh, the first one is going to be skipped. And you can see here that we have the two and the three. And that's because we took three of them and we skipped one. And that, this is actually pretty convenient when working with small arrays. Let's say you have array of numbers, new, number come on new integer okay so it's one two three four five six and let's say we want to skip the first two elements take the next two skip the last two we can say right line string dot join using a delimiter a white space and say numbers or numbers let's let's call it numbers numbers dot take or skip to skip the first two elements take the next two skip the last two okay be careful though using large numbers will most probably result in an error in our case not really but just be careful with that if we say take 76 it is just going to take the available ones okay it's not really going to get any empty numbers or something like that. So if we say skip to, take to, skip to again, we have six numbers here. We're going to skip the first two, we're going to take the next two, and skip the last two. And we get three and four as our output. For some reason we don't get anything, okay? So let's say skip to one okay this should be working fine hmm. let's remove this one now this one this one let's remove this one and say okay so numbers skip to take two let's try skip to take two okay we got it three and four and we can even say take three, four, five, or take everything up to the last number. So we have three, four, and five. Okay, this is pretty straightforward. Now, we have a simple problem. We have the problem called largest three numbers. What we need to do is we get a list of real numbers and we need to print the largest three of them, okay? So how are we going to do that? First of all, I encourage you to try it on your own. And keep in mind that using these methods that we show right now, such as order, take, skip, select, are going to be pretty convenient when solving this problem. Okay, so try doing this problem on your own. And after that, we're going to work it out or work through it ourselves or together okay I assume you tried working on this problem yourself let's now do it together 
First of all, we need a collection of integers. We'll get a collection of integers, but not in this form. We'll get them as a string. So what we can do is we can create collection of integers or array of integers, and we can say console that read line to take the whole input from the console. We can split it by white space. What happens now is split is going to return to us a string array. What, we, what can we do with a string array? Think about it. Well, we can morph each element or map each element to its integer equivalent. Okay, so we can parse each element and turn it into an integer. But now, because we have a new collection after we mapped everything, we need to say to array. Okay, so we got a new collection from the old one and we morphed it or transformed it, converted it into an array. What we can do now is say integer, was it shortest or largest three numbers? So, okay, so integer largest three numbers. We can say numbers dot order by descending x. Okay, what happens now? What happens after we order them by descending? Well, the largest three elements are going to be the first three elements in the collection. This is why we're ordering by descending. What we can do after we order by descending is we can say dot take three and we can say two array. Okay, so as you can see, we are ordering by descending the collection and ordering the integers inside. And by ordering them by descending, we know that the first three integers are going to be the first three elements in the collection. And by knowing that, we can take them using the take function. And we can say two array. You, you always need to do two array if you're doing something with link. Not only two array, but any type of conversion function since it's not going to work otherwise. Okay? So now if we print them, we can say string join using a white space as a delimiter and we can say largest three numbers. Okay, let's check out whether we have solved the problem correctly. So we have 10, 30, 15, 20, 50, 5. So we have 10, 30, 15, 20, 55. Okay, as you can see here, we get 50, we get 30, and we get 20. And this is how you solve this problem using only link. Only link. So we get the input from the console using the split function. We get everything as a string. We split it by white spaces. We convert it into integers because it's strings. It's just an array of strings after the, the split function. And finally, we convert it to array because select doesn't really return a whole collection. And after that, we take the existing collection that we fetched from the console or the existing sequence and we order it by descending to make it to make sure that the first three items in the collection or the, in the array are always the largest. And by making sure with the order by descending function that this is correct, we use the take function to take the first three items and turn them into an array, into a new array, okay? Finally, we output the result and we get the three largest number in a collection. Now let's check the actual solution. As you can see, it's pretty much the same as the one we did. So we convert each string into an integer and instead of using array, they are using lists here. It doesn't really matter. Finally, ordering and taking the first three items from the collection and outputting everything together. Now, 
this is a pretty straightforward problem. But in order for you to get better, you need to practice. Try finding other problems which you can solve using the language integrated query. It is time that we discuss the lambda functions. Now, we used the lambda functions previously, but we didn't really know what we were doing. Now, we are going to try to interpret these lambda functions or inline or anonymous functions and gain this intuition about them and how to use them. Now, first of all, the lambda function or expression is just an anonymous function. And this is a really convenient way to define a function in an inline manner. The lambda expression contains the lambda operator, which is the equal greater sign. And it is read as goes to. So if we have something like x, this sign x plus 2, it says x goes to x plus 2. So it's sort of a mapping. Remember when we were using the lambda expressions or lambda functions or anonymous functions inside the select method. We were telling it select x goes to x plus 2 or something like that. And what, what is really important in lambda functions or expressions is that the left side specifies the input parameters and the right side holds the expression or the statement. Now, let's see an example of actual lambda function. First of all, we have this one. So it's x goes to x over 2, or x divided by 2. What happens now is under the hood, we get this inline method. We get int function, where int x, the parameter, goes to x divided by 2. And you'll see here that the left side, everything on the left here, we can even have x, y, is defined as the parameter here. So we have one parameter called x. And this parameter goes to x divided by 2. So whatever we had here on the right side is the actual expression. And we can see uh, another way of defining a lambda function here. We can say var lambda equals x. And keep in mind that just wrapping the parameters inside parentheses is completely OK, where x goes to x divided by 2. OK? So we can say function of int and this is the lambda. So delegate did not take one argument. OK, for some reason, let, let's remove this one. Say delegate function did not take one argument. Can we do return? Hmm. OK, so we have x goes. So x goes to x over 2. does not take one argument what function okay yep now the thing is that we also need to specify the return type but for now this doesn't really matter what matters is that under the hood we get x which is the parameter the input parameter and we get x divided by 2 which is the return value and we can see another one and this is x is the parameter, the input parameter. x different than 0 is the output parameter. Now, as you can see here, because we are saying x different than 0, and this, is eval this evaluates to Boolean expression, or this is a Boolean expression, evaluates to bool. It says bool function of x returns whether x is different than zero. 
And if we say here function of int and bool, this is our lambda, and this is x is different than zero, we can now say console right line whether lambda of five is true or not. Okay? And supplying argument to the lambda function, this argument will go here and the expression will be evaluated. So it will say, is five different than zero? And the answer is true. So we'll get true here. But if we say the function no longer takes int and returns bool, but it takes int and returns int, we'll see that this now will not work because it will say cannot in implicitly convert type bool to type int. Okay, so we can say something like x plus 10. Debugging it will produce the output of 15. Why? Because we supply as argument 5. Okay? So this is how lambdas work under the hood. They just create a function. It's an anonymous function, ju just a definition of a function in an inline manner. If we say no arguments go to 42, it will create for us an int function. Why? Because we are returning, so everything on the right is returned to the user or to the, pro to the invoker of the function or, or the method. It always, always returns 42. This is why we need an integer here as a return data type. Integer function returns 42. And notice it's called function. It's, it's not called um, get count or select or something like that. It always returns an integer and it's an anonymous function. And this integer is 42. Okay, now where can we use such inline functions? One of them is inside the where method. The where method is part of the link library. And where just takes some function and using that function decides which items in a collection to return to the user. Let's see it in action. So let's say we have this function called um, from int to bool. And by the way, when using where, the function always needs to return bool. And you, you'll see in a moment why. So we get this function and we have uh, where x goes to x different than zero. Okay? So we have this and we have a collection of integers or an array of integers. New int, uh, 5, 6, 8, 9, 11. Okay? Now, what happens is if we say array.where, where is just a method that allows us to select certain types or certain elements from this collection that conform to some rule that we have specified using the lambda. And our rule, currently our rule says, every time you face an element x inside the collection that is different than zero, take it. Take it from that collection. And if we place a zero item here and a zero item here, what happens now is whenever an item from the collection evaluates to true using the function, it is going to be returned to us. Okay, let, let's do something like this. Console right line, string join. We go here and we say where function. Okay, so what happens now is we say take everything from the array or give me everything from the array which conforms to this rule. It's simply a rule, a way to test whether element conforms to this rule. 
And if we say uh, function of 5, function of 0, and function of minus 2, all of these evaluate to some Boolean variable. So this is true, this is false, and this is true. What happens is where is going to take all the elements that produce true whenever input it to this function. Okay? And if we now start a program, we'll see that we get every single item that was originally in the collection, but now all the items that were equal to zero are out of the, uh, of the final result that we have. Why? Because our function tests whether an item is zero or not. What happens now if we say that we need all the items that are equal to zero here, look at this, we change from different than zero to equal than zero, what do you think happens now? Pause the video and think about it. What happens now is that we get every single item except for those that are not equal to zero. Why? Because items that are not equal to zero produce false here, produce false. This is not okay. If, it, if the item produces false when inputted to the function, it means that it shouldn't be added to the result. This is how where works. And now if we say where Higgs plus zero, we'll see that this does not work. Okay, if we say integer here, we'll see that this, th this does not work. Why? Because, look at this, cannot convert function of int and int into function of int and bool. And as we know, the first argument here is the input, and the second argument is the return type. And basically what happens is that the compiler knows that where requires a bool boolean result and it will not allow you to place a function that produces an integer result okay so your function when specifying a function or lambda inside the where method it needs to be boolean it needs to return boolean variable and the input can be virtually anything but one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that whenever specifying an input to the function, explicitly specifying I mean, because if you specify it right here inside, you'll see that it will automatically assign a type to this input. You can see here that it automatically assigned integer to the input. Why? Because the collection that where is working on currently is made of integers. You see here it's an integer array. If we change this to string and take string as an input and return bool, this is not going to work. Same here function or lambda. You'll see here that this is not working. Okay? cannot convert from string bool to int int bool. It's just not working, okay? Now, what we can also do with lambdas is use it everywhere where lambdas can go. In this example, something called count is used. And count is a way to count the elements of a collection, to count the number of elements that you have. One interesting, interesting thing is that you can supply a lambda into the count method and it will skip every element that doesn't conform to this rule inside the lambda. So basically what, I'm, what we are saying here is that we have a collection of numbers, collection of numbers, that have some count but we count only the numbers inside that are even so we are counting the number of even numbers and if you can if you see here one is not even it's odd number two is even 
four is even, six is even. Therefore, count produces three, not six, because this is two, four, six items. So there is a total of six items inside the, the array, but because count only counts the items that conform to the rule that was given here with the lambda, it only counted three items because only three items conform to this rule. And this rule is that the element, the element must be even. And we'll see here that if we say something like, okay, uh, console write line array dot count, array dot count, this will give us the count of the array. And if we say array dot count as as the property or array dot length, this is the property which counts the numbers, the, the number of items inside the array. And array dot count will give the same thing. If we go here, you can see that count is seven. So th this is count and length. So the count is equal to length. But what we can do now is say, okay, I don't want you to count the whole collection. I want you to count where X goes to zero or where X is different than zero. So count each element that is not equal to zero. And if we debug now, we'll see that the count that we counted using the, the lambdas is not the same as the whole length, the original length of the array. And as I said, the reason is that count takes this lambda, it's optional, you can also omit it, but if you supply a lambda, it's not going to count the whole thing. It's going to count only the numbers that conform to this rule that the lambda is. Basically, whenever you input something to the lambda, you need to get true in order to be validated, in order to be validating when the, the count function does its thing. So it's just checking. Okay, it has this black box, it gets the number, it puts it into the black box. If it gets true, it adds it to the count, otherwise not. Okay, let's continue. Now, one thing we can do is sorting using the lambda. Okay, so we have order by, and we saw this syntax earlier, but we didn't really know what it is. So order by x, where x goes to x. Okay, what does this mean? Well, it means that we are going to use the default sorting mechanism of the data type. Okay, so if we have integers here, we say put the integer into the, the lambda and take it out. Sort it in this way. So just the, it, it just takes the integers and sorts them with the default way the integers are solved are, are sorted and if we take the three we'll, we'll see that we get 11 22 33 this is because order by sorts everything by ascending now if we say take everything from the numbers where x goes to x less than 50 this means that we get everything from the numbers array where x the number x is less than 50 and we'll get these four numbers 11 33 44 22 but keep in mind here that where does not sort the array it just returns the items that conform to this rule here so if the item produces true when it's inputted into this function it's legible for the where function where function just includes it into the final result okay now we have the count and we have the select examples so first of all the count here says get the count of the numbers which are div when divided by two with remainder the remainder is one okay so it takes every number divides it by two and if the rem if remainder is one, it equals to true. Okay, so if the remainder one, the, if remainder is one, it equals to true. And the only number or 
the only numbers that are conforming to this thing are five. So the numbers, the count of the numbers inside the numbers array that conform to this rule here that every one of them has to be equal to one when divided with remainder by two is five. Okay? So which ones do you think are the five numbers that conform to this rule? Where one of them is 11. One of them might be 77, probably. And probably 54, maybe. 98, 30, uh, or no. Nah. It's 11, 77, 55, 33. And something like that okay so finally we have numbers select where X goes to X times 2 so ba basically what happens now is let me do it this way this select here this select is the same as going from bar or in for for int e equals 0 int less than 5, e++, plus plus, and it does this. So we have an integer of numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and what happens now is we get every single element and we put it through this function. And the function is it takes integer and it returns integer. Why? Because it's x goes to x times 2. So this is our lambda and we need to input everything into the lambda when using select. So we have the lambda, we have x goes to x times 2. Okay and now every single element is inputted to the lambda and the result of the lambda goes again into the collection. And this here is array of e. Okay? Well, let's do it this way. Int element equals lambda array e. And we say element. Okay? Now, if we print out the collection, we say string join in the array, we'll see. Let's just fix the error. Somewhere here we have an error, error, error. Oh, here it is. Fixing the error means that we get every single number multiplied by two. Let's check out the, the old collection. Let's say old. You can say string dot join. String dot join and array. And we can say new. New, which is string dot join the new array okay so we have the old here and we have the new one as you can see here the select function just takes every single number as an input and outputs some other version you can even say something like x goes to x or x goes to x it will be the same thing the collection just won't change everything is the same okay I hope you understand what select means what count means what where means and how do we use lambdas to define inline or anonymous functions and work with these methods now one really useful method is called distinct what distinct does is as you can see here we have a collection of elements and it takes every unique element. So it basically creates a set of elements. And as we know, in mathematics, sets don't really contain duplicate, duplicate elements. They're always unique. So distinct means that we take every unique element and put it into a new collection. And as you can see here, in this collection, the first one, we have two, two again, two again, but in the new collection, we have only one two. 
Now imagine we have a string array of names. Let's let's say we have names. Say string array of new string and names. Some names, let's say John, let's say Mary, let's say George, let's say Ivan, let's say uh, dragon even, it doesn't really matter what. And we can say array.distinct and this will take every single element or let's add duplicates let's add John again let's add Mary again and as you can see here we have a lot of duplicates right so we have John John Mary Mary George Ivan dragon if we say array dot distinct here array dot distinct the distinct method will dispose of every duplicate item here it will re the only one duplicate will remain or only one copy will remain so if we say start we'll say John Mary George Ivan dragon every duplicate in the collection was disposed of okay this is what this thing does okay now there are a lot of ways to use such lambda functions and there are even more link methods that utilize them. Try to find another way to use the lambda functions, try to find problems to solve with them and try to research more about link and which methods can take lambdas as input. it is time that we solve a problem related to lambdas and link now the problem that we are going to solve is going is is called short words sorted the main idea of the problem is that we have a text that is going to be supplied to us we need to remove every duplicated word we need to sort them alphabetically this means in, ascend, in ascending order alphabetically we need to find all short words that are less than five characters and finally we need to separate them using some delimiters to produce this processed sequence now the first thing that we need to do is find all words that are less than five characters then split them or probably just first split them find the short words sort them and remove the duplicates this is probably one of the best sequences that you can use here as an algorithm try to solve this problem on your own pause the video and try it yourself okay now assuming that you already tried to do it yourself or not we're going to work through this problem together now the first thing that we need to do is capture the input so we're going to say something like string of words equals console that read line dot split new character and keep in mind here I'm not using only one delimiter I'm using many of them so I'm using different separators different indicators through which I'm going to separate or split the sequence I get from the console first one is dot the next one is comma the next one is the double dot and this line delimiter that we use okay so we get the dot this one we get the double dot we get this one let's actually remove it and define it on its own the limiters this way your code is way less littered with stuff and it's way readable and understandable so we can say here that we have these delimiters 
and we can later pass them here. And we can also call something split string split options that remove empty entries. And this is used simply to remove all the unnecessary white spaces or empty spaces that are produced after the split the splitting infer the, the splitting stage. Okay? So we get parentheses and square brackets. So we need to add to the delimiters parentheses square brackets okay so parentheses square brackets and some more of them okay we need quotation marks single quotes backslashes forward slashes exclamation marks question marks and many many different stuff okay so we need backslash we need forward slash for which we are going to use an escape technique I think yep so we need a forward slash we need quotation marks which is this quotation mark we need the single single quote okay we have the backslash the forward slash exclamation mark question mark and now we get the white space okay so all these delimiters we're going to use to split the string now after we have processed this we need to find each word so we need to say right line or before li right line let's create a new string array uh, output words we can say words that where the length of x the length of each input is less than five that order them by alpha order them alphabetically dot I think it was let, let me see so we need to make them lowercase I think yep lowercase and we need to remove the duplicated words okay but before I do that can you think of the way that we're going to lowercase them and we're going to remove the duplicates Think about it. Even if you haven't worked through this problem yourself, think about it right now. How do we remove, using link and lambdas, how do we, re we remove copies? And how do we make everything lowercase? Okay, now the answer is this. First of all, we say select and turn everything into lower turn everything to lowercase and then let me just do this and this and this and this so first of all we turn everything into lowercase we take every word where its length is less than five order them alphabetically and they and then take each distinct element from this ordering Finally, we need to convert everything to array. Okay, so this is the sequence that we got. The sequence of operations. Now, you could do this pretty easily with, without link using for loops, for each loops, and so forth. The trick here is that link makes this extremely easy for you. It's extremely convenient when you have to do it in a fast way just writing a piece of code, just testing out something or just doing some database queries or some aggregation of data. It's, it's an abstract way to easily do all of these things. Now, if we say output words here, we should, we should get everything correctly. Okay, so I have the input here. 
and supplying it here. Okay, we need to join the collection. We'll say string dot join in this. What happens now? We say debug. Okay, so we have two three and C sharp can go in Java PHP U. Is this the correct answer? C sharp and two three and C sharp can go in Java PHP U. So this is the correct solution to the problem. Okay, what did we do? First of all, we captured the input. We captured the input using the console read line. So this takes the input. After we took the input, we split the input by these delimiters. So whenever we find such delimiter, we split on left and right string. Okay? So split the string into words. After we split everything into words, we removed the empty entries. What does an empty, empty entry mean? Well, empty entry is this, string.empty, okay? So saying empty entry, come on, empty entry is equal just to this, okay? So if we test this, we'll see it's true. Why it's true? Because an empty entry is just this thing. It's just an empty string. This is why we needed the string split options here. Remove empty entries. Because if we tokenize so much the string, it may produce these empty places. Just empty strings which we don't need which will just jam our program. This is why we're using remove empty entry entries. Finally, we outputted the words, but before outputting them, we lower cased everything. So basically we had these words, which we lowered case using this morphing function, take every word, turn it into lowercase, and take every word where the length and by the way, take everything from the lowered case words. We're no longer in this line with the where, we're no longer working with the original collection, we're working with the modified one. And we're taking every word where the length is less than five. We order them by alphabetic, or order them alphabetically, and we take each distinct item, each distinct item. Finally, we turn them into an array and we output them. This is how we solve this, solve this problem. Okay, and as you can see here, the solution is pretty straightforward and it's also the same as ours. So we have the delimiters, we have the read line, and by the way, this is a pretty much more efficient way to lowercase the input, just say dot lowercase, instead of using the morphing function. And we split them and we do our, our thing. So we filter by word length and then take the distinct order and take the distinct words. Finally output them. This is how we solved the problem here. It's almost the same as our solution. Now in order to master this topic or anything at all, you need to practice a lot. Please keep in mind that the more problems you solve using dictionaries, using lambdas, using links, the better you're going to get at them and the better your mental capacity will be. To wrap up with the link in the lambdas, it is good to look at some other beneficial methods that you can use. The first of them is called dot first. Dot first returns the first item in a sequence of elements. Now imagine that we don't have a lambda inside a dot first. So we have an integer array consisting of a couple of elements. So we have one, two, three, four, 
okay in this integer array we say print line or write line array dot first what happens now is it will print one why one because it's the first element in the collection but now I can supply a lambda inside the first the dot first method which says give me the first item that conforms to this rule and the rule I'm going to specify is x percent of 2 is equal to 0 what this means is that give me each number that is equal to 0 when divided by 2 when divided with remainder okay this means that the number should be even so this says give me the first even number the first even number okay so starting a program will not return 1 which is the first number in the sequence in the collection it will return 2 and the reason is that we have this predicate which the first item needs to conform to and 1 divided by divided with remainder by 2 is not 0 okay so this is not possible this is why it takes 2 as an item now the next one is called dot last and dot last does the same thing but with the last item that it can find so if no predicate is specified if no lambda is specified here you'll see that the dot last returns the last item it can find in a collection so it's just the last item it can find uh, one other thing is you can supply a predicate here or a lambda and you can say give me the last item that is not even so give me the last item that is not even and it will give me three why because three is not even but if I say give me the last item that is even it will give it the last item that is even which is four and four is even okay we can say give me the last item that is less than 12 or less than 2 let's say and it will give 1 why well because 1 is the last item that is less than 2 this is what last does okay finally here we have single something called single dot single what dot single does is it takes a specific item from the collection but only if it exists if two or more items of the same type exist it will throw an error and let's see what happens if we say dot single and specify no predicate it will say invalid operation exception sequence contains more than one element and as I said it needs to have only one element in the collection to use single without any predicate here and if we say start it will print out the item so single works only if you have one specific item in the collection without supplying a lambda you need to have collection with one item inside but if we say okay now give me the single element but the single element that is equal to 2 this is going to be okay why because single takes the only one element that conforms to the lambda okay and if we have another one element here it is going to throw an exception sequence contains more than one matching element if we have more than one matching element it is just going to throw an exception this is what single does now two other really nice methods that we can use one of them is called reverse which is actually pretty straightforward it just takes a collection of items and reverses them it just reverses the order of items so if here's one two three four five six here we have six five four three two one and imagine we have dates 
if we want to reverse the dates, we just say dates that reverse, just reverse the dates. And one other cool thing we can do is call concat. Concat means concatenate. So it comes from conca concatenate. What we do now with concat is let's say we have two arrays, we have array two, new int array of, okay, let's see, one, two, three, four. Let's remove the two here. And we can use both reverse and concat to create a symmetric array. We can say array two is equal to array to dot reverse. And we can say right line, let's say two array. And we can say right line of array one dot concat with array two. Okay? And we can say string dot join the concatenation of the two arrays. And you'll see now that it takes the two arrays, it reverses the one, and concatenates them together. And we have one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one. Okay? And we can even access different indexes or different indices. We say two array here and we access index five. We can do that. Okay? It will return three. Why? Because we concatenated we combined the two arrays together. So this is what concatenate does, or concat. It just combines two arrays together. Okay, not even not only arrays, but other collections too. It doesn't really matter what kind of collection you have, as long as it has, it's, it's a collection and has items, okay? Now, let's solve one problem that makes use of all of these functions. And the problem is we have fold and sum. The problem that we have is fold and sum. We need to read an array of four times k integers. This means four times k means that the integers are always going to be, the number of integers is going, is always going to be a multiple of four. So it, it, it will always be able to, it will always be multiple of four. We, we cannot have two integers because it's not four times k. It's not divisible by four, okay? So the number is always going to be divisible by four. The number of, uh, the number, of, uh, the, number the, the count we're going to have, the, the number of integers. So here you'll see that we have two, four, six, eight, and eight is divisible by four. This conforms to this rule here, four times k integers. We need to fold it like shown here and print the sum of the upper and the lower rows. Okay, now the first thing we need to do is to fold them. How can we fold them? Well, we take the first two or the first two times k or the first k, let's say the first k. We take the first k, we reverse them. We take the last k integers, we reverse them and we sum the, the two rows together, okay? Now, try this problem on your own. Try to solve it on your own, and a little quick hint, you can use the functions that we, or the methods that we defined previously. The reverse, the concat, the first, the last, so forth, so forth, okay? And after you've tried, we're going to work through this problem together. Now, let's try solve the problem together. First of all, we need to capture the input. So we're going to say integer numbers is going to equal to console read line split by space dot select and parse. Okay, so we parse the integers and feed them into an array. We have this thing. Okay, so after we captured the input, we need to get the first k integers, the last k integers, and fold them together. Okay, 
so how are we going to do that? Well, first of all, let's say uh, top left row, which is the first k integers in the reverse order. We need to say numbers dot take k and k is going to be the count over four numbers that count over four that length yep that length over four because we know that the length of the the array that we get is going to be four times k okay it's always going to be divisible by four multiple of four so we, we take the first k numbers we reverse them and turn them into array we take the top right row which is the last k numbers so we're going to say uh, numbers that reverse that take four I I'm pretty sure you can do it other ways too but this is just a convenient one just reverse them take the last two or just say okay to array we can now say top row equals top left concat top right okay so we concatenate the two arrays basically what happens now is we take the first you can see here we have two four six eight and the number that we sh we fold is k over two why because we fold two four and the count is eight so eight over four is equal to two so it's equal to two and this means that two or two is equal to k and we have four times k four times k which is eight this is the total count eight divided by four we get the little pieces here the number of elements that we need to fold and concat after that we can say four and e equals zero e is less than the let's actually get the bottom row too so bottom row is equal to numbers skip k and take k times 2 okay say 2 array we can say now e while e is less than the row we can have come on less than the row but length we can have right line the sum of the elements so we can have oh let's first fed feed them into a list or into result new int of bottom row that length we can say result of e equals top row of e plus bottom row of e there are other ways to do that we can even use the select function for that reason we can say string that join and we can say the result okay so debugging gives us let's see one two three four five one two three four five six seven eight and we get five five thirteen thirteen okay so it's the same result if we say five two three six let's say five two three six five two three six we get seven nine okay so this is the result here so how did we solve this problem first of all one of the most important things we considered this statement here that the number of integers that we are going to get is four times k which means that the number of integers is going to be multiple of four this is really important next we need to fold them in some way and the way we fold them we can see he here is that we take the first integers first n integers and the last n integers 
we reverse them and fold them. So, so we have 2, 1, 8, 7. Okay, but how do we get the number here? How do we get the number of integers that we, ne we ne need to take from the start and from the end? And the, re the, the, the answer is that we first count them all. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So what portion is 2 of 8? Well, it's 4. Okay, so, uh, well, basically, 8 divided by 2 is equal to 4. And we see here that dividing 8 by 4 gives us k. Or, in other words, 2 is the k portion of the count. So we have 4 times k, and in our case, k is 2, which equals to 8. This is how we know that k is the number of items at the beginning and at the end that we get and fold. Why? Because if it if multiplied it, multiplied by 4, so if k is multiplied by 4, we get the count. Okay? And we know that the numbers that we fold is 2. So what happens is 2 times 4 is 8, which means 2 is equal to k. Okay, so we need to fold k numbers from the beginning and k numbers from the end. So we get lower row of 2 times k integers, the count is 2 times k, and the upper row is 2 times k also. After that, we take the top left corner we take the top left corner, the top left case, reverse them, we take the last case, reverse, uh, re reverse the whole sequence, take again the case, make them to array, concatenate them together, take the bottom row, and sum them. This is the simple algorithm that we are using for this problem. And you can see here that pretty much the same thing is done. We take the integers, the sequence of integers, we divide their length by 4 in order to get k, we take the top left corner, we take k integers from the beginning, reverse them, make them to array, we take the last k integers, we concatenate the top left and the right left, or the first k and the last k, we concatenate them together, and then we get the bottom row, which is skip k, take 2 times k. Why? Well, if we go back here, you'll see that we skip k and we take 2 times k, which is in our example here, we take 2, we take, or we skip 2 and we take 4 just to get the bottom row. Okay? Finally, here they are using dot select to sum using the indexes or the indices, okay? So basically, dot select here means that we take every single item in row one or the top row and sum it with the corresponding item with the same index in the bottom row or row two. And they pretty much get the same thing, but it's a little bit more confusing. So what did we learn today? Well, in this section, we'll learn about dictionaries and we'll learn about lambdas and link. So what was a dictionary? A dictionary is just a collection, also called symbol map, or symbol table, map, or associative array. It's just a collection which holds key and associated value. Basically, it hold, holds pairs of keys and values. The dictionaries can be sorted or not sorted. It's just a table of key value pairs, whether sorted or not. We know about the key property, which holds all the keys, all, it holds a set of unique keys, 
because we know that the key needs to be unique and we know about the value or the values which holds a collection of values we also know that when iterating through this dictionary we need to use the key value pair so basically iterating over the dictionary use the key and value pair now we already know that using lambdas and links we greatly simplify the way we process information inside our program so lambda was just an inline function inline definition of a function which takes some value and returns some value and lambdas could be used together with link which is, stands for language integrated query to help us process information regardless of its source the moment you say using system.link extension methods or additional methods additional logic is added to your collections and regardless of the source you can query them in certain way like we were using the where method to distinguish between elements we were using the max the min and the average method in the sum to do mathematical operations like in exa for example the sum method would just combine everything will just sum every element inside a collection or the average will, will take the sum divided by the count of the elements and we could also use methods like order by order by descending take skip to additionally ease the way we process information now mastering these concepts requires a lot of practice so my advice is continue working as hard as you've already been and do the exercises that you're given 